Well, yesterday, yesterday, Ian entertained, amused, educated, talked with enthusiasm like he always does, and reinforced many points that he's made many times before. I don't know about you, but I loved yesterday. I never get tired of hearing Ian talk. Um, I hope we'll hear him talk many, many more times here at this conference because I just love to listen to him and he's a great friend. Let me just introduce again, Dr. Ian Dunbar. Um, how to effectively correct and punish. The word uh, correct, I would like to define, um, and both these words are very maligned words because they both have connotations, uh, very negative connotations. When we think of correction, we think of actually doing something like a leash jerk, don't we? Automatically you think, oh, correction. He's talking leash correction. When we say punishment, we think we're doing something which is unpleasant. Um, and I would question both of those things. And I would say, no, for me, a correction means I think Jean-Luc Picard would say it. He would say, make it correct. And what he means is, at the moment you're doing it wrong, can we make it correct, please? That's what we want to do. So that's what I mean by correction, that you do something that, number one, stops the dog getting it wrong and helps the dog getting it right. And that's what I mean by correction. By punishment, um, I mean the pure learning theory definition, or one of the learning theory definitions. There are several. I don't know whether you know that. And the one that we normally all use is a punishment is something that comes after the misbehavior and causes it to decrease in frequency and reduces the likelihood it would occur in the future. Okay? That's, that's all I mean by punishment. Um, and the talk by saying how to effectively punish, um, the choice of punishment is up to the individual trainer, i.e. it's up to you. I know how I'm going to do it, and I show you videos of how I try and teach owners to do it, um, and I want owners to learn how to punish the dog using two training tools only, their brain and their voice. And the reason is, all so often at home with the dog, and certainly if ever you're in competition, that's all you have. Your brain, hopefully, mine wasn't too good this morning, so I wouldn't have been training any dogs before noon, um, and your voice. This is what you always have. I want dogs under voice control. Um, it, it's the only thing you have at home so often. You know, sometimes you don't even have your voice. You know, if you're holding the baby, you're cooking on the stove, and you're eating a chocolate chip cookie. You know, even then, a voice correction can be hazardous. So I generally use some guttural sort of, ah! make a noise like that, so I don't choke on the cookie, but I'm going to get the dog's attention and stop him doing what he's doing. Yesterday, I said we need to quantify. Um, if you remember just one word from my lecture yesterday and from my lecture today, it will, I hope it's that word, quantify. I want you to count everything. I want you to count the behaviors, behaviors you want, good behaviors, goal behaviors, criterions, and I want you to count bad behaviors, misbehaviors, um, growls and lunges and dogs running off away from you, dogs not responding. You've got to count those to show that from day to day it's improving. So on Wednesday, we get the dog Monday, and on Wednesday now we have more good behaviors and fewer bad behaviors. Agreed? It's a no-brainer, right? I mean, I, I hope I'm not insulting you with the simplicity of this, but it's such a no-brainer that no one's doing it. Um, when I go to dog training classes, and I see many, I can't explain, wherever I go, um, I was in India, I saw a dog training class. You know, wherever I go, they say, oh, Ian, I'm doing a puppy class tonight, would you like to come? And I'm thinking, well, actually, you know, Sitting in a bar or lying on the beach would be more in line with what I want to do, but I'll come and I do it because it makes them very happy. And I go and I look and see a lot of good stuff, 
I sometimes see some not so good stuff, but I've never seen quantification like I do it. When I train, I always have a stopwatch hanging around my neck. Whatever we're doing, if uh, walking on leash, I say go. And I set them up a little course to walk, and I keep the stopwatch running, and then I stop it again. Why? Now the dog's pulling. Now I start it again. Now the dog's walking on leash. And after they've done the circuit, I say, that's not bad. You had 45 seconds of really nice leash walking. That's your record. Beat it. Sit stay, I mentioned it with the Jack Russell. Literally, it was less than one second sit stay. After 60 minutes, it could do a one minute sit stay. It's cool. And the whole thing of quantifying the behavior, I can now give the owner feedback. So not only can I evaluate my training methods, and, not, and here I don't mean me training the dog, but me teaching the owner to train the dog, I can prove to myself that the advice I'm giving them is working. I don't yet need to change to plan B or plan C. And that's all clocked in my head. Any problem, if you present a problem with me, dog barks when you're at work, plan A is don't feed him from a bowl, put his food in squirrel dudes, freeze him, and let him eat from that. And count the barks. You've got to count the barks. You've got to show that what you have advised is working. And it should be working within one, two, or three minutes. Um, if a dog snaps and lunges at another dog, do something. Okay, I won't go into what I would do, but do something, and then test them out again. But no, what do we do? We do something. Usually we say, stop it, don't do that. And we never let them get together again. You, you don't do anything that proves that what you did actually worked. Because what I want to see, if, if one dog sniffs another's butt, and then this dog snaps... I want to see that we can train this dog to enjoy having his butt sniffed. And that this dog can sniff a butt with impunity without having his face ripped off. Agreed? So we must quantify the behaviors. The good behaviors, the bad behaviors. I think we should also quantify rewards and punishments. Um, the easy way to do this, of course, is um, we've got so many clicker trainers now. And in this room, we've got a lot of people who use remote collars. They should have counters on. It's so simple. Here you've got um, clickers should be electronic devices. I want to know how many clicks you gave that dog, how many rewards before you reach criterion. Let's say a simple criterion, a three-minute downstay. And you're going to start training 10 adolescent Labradors. Well, I think by the end of an hour, you should have a three-minute downstay on all of those ten dogs. Agreed? In class? I want to know how many rewards that took. Why do I want to know it? Um, I want to be able to have a meaningful discussion with someone about the efficiency of training methods. At the moment, we just argue emotionally. And we use words like, no, this is right. What you're doing is wrong. It's bullshit. It's not a training discussion. I want to know, number one, the dog was trained. It reached criterion. And how long did it take? How many minutes? Which is really important in pet dog training. Because the pet owner's not going to hang around like a lot of you are. A lot of you are probably in working dog or obedience clubs where you go year after year. You've been doing it for, what, 70 years now, and you've got your first arch? Whoa, it's taken her 70 years to get her first arch. And so I would say now... <laughs> with your students, we could now speed up the process, and so you could get a student who gets an arch after seven years. And then I would say, that's good. Now see if you can get a student who can do it after one year. You see what I mean? And so we always want to know how long did it take, how many rewards did it take. Now, here to me is the big difference between rewards and punishments. With rewards, we're generally praising, well, he's a good boy, we're petting the dog, Gee or we're given a food treat, or we're throwing a tennis ball. And these are things that we generally acknowledge the dog likes, right? And so if we do too much of it, in some ways it's no big deal. The dog just says, I love this training thing. I mean, it's like going into a food vending hall. It's fantastic. It should be, they should have the same feeling, you know, as when they go to the vet clinic. And they go to the vet clinic, and if they have a good vet there, I want that dog vomiting when he leaves. He's had so much freeze-dried liver. The little dog looks back, and it's mum and dad's vet clinic. And boom, ugh, he throws up. But he can't wait to go to the vet clinic again, because it was such a pleasurable experience. Okay? 
So the side effects of too many punishments are the dog likes it. The side effects may be you now have a spoiled dog who's not doing what you ask him to do. And I see this a lot now in classes. In classes I see, uh, they're fun, there's oodles of food treats, the sound of clickers is deafening, it's like there's a busload of Japanese tourists in the room, you know, <laughs> click, 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 like this. But what I want to see is, I want to see that one minute sit stay. And I'm not seeing it so much, and I think what's happened is, we've put the dog on a continuous reinforcement schedule, how can it learn? Remember what we said yesterday about differential, and what are the reinforcement schedules we should use with dogs? Only one, a short-term differential reinforcement. Below average behaviors, just get a <clears throat> Above average behaviors, good boy. Really above average behaviors, good boy, bit of kibble. And jackpot behaviors, get jackpots. Five bits of freeze-dried liver, a bit of smoked turkey, a French kiss, and then go play. Okay? How, uh, we would never use a continuous reinforcement. You're training any animal, but it's actually being recommended with clickers. I think it's absolutely wrong, and I think it's like one day I went to pick up my kid from Montessori school, so this was pre-kindergarten, and I looked at his homework, and he got a gold star. Well, the night before, I said, Jamie, do your homework, then you can watch TV. Um, no, he rushed his homework, it was crap and the teacher gave him a gold star. And I went in and I said, look, we pay 800 bucks a month for my son to come here so that when he gets into kindergarten, he's a whiz. You just gave him a gold star for this piece of crap. So this isn't worth a gold star, a silver star, a bronze star. This gets a black splodge, <laughs> which means thank you for handing it in. Next time, try and do some work on it. I was furious. We would never do that. We would never use a continuous reinforcement because the animal can't learn. I always have animals on short-term differential reinforcements. So what do I mean by short-term? My brain can't do it for more than three or four minutes at a time. My brain is fried. I'm calculating all the behaviors. I'm timing everything. I'm working out what the dog does, how many times I reward, how many times I punish. And it's, it takes a lot of brain energy. But the dog's going to learn a lot in that three to four minute schedule. Okay? When it comes to punishments, if the punishments are unpleasant. Now notice the if, because they don't have to be. This is a huge misassumption that a punishment has to be something the dog doesn't like. No, a punishment has to be something that changes the behavior. I liken a lot of dog training to doing things that I like doing, and those of you who know me know skiing is a passion. Uh, drinking beer is a passion. Dancing is a passion. Uh, last night, I was trying to teach people how to drink beer, but they went off, I don't know what they're doing, pulling dollars from under quarters or some mindless activity. I wanted to play drinking games. I know loads of drinking games. I'm a, I'm a, a certified cardial puffian. I want to play motor track drinking. You know that? That's the simplest game when you get very drunk. I want to play the complicated fizz buzz. You know that? When you're all in a circle, you have to count. One, two, three, four, fizz, six, buzz. But each time you fizz or buzz, so fizz is five and multiples are five, and buzz is, is seven or multiples are seven, you have to reverse order. So it goes one, two, three, four, fizz, six, buzz, eight, nine, fizz. And then we get up to 14, which would be buzz. 15 would be fizz, fizz. 55 would be fizz, fizz, fizz. You get it? You make one mistake, you drink the whole beer. Then we start again. If I'm teaching someone to ski or to dance, and this is how I view dog training. I view dog training, healing, as an exquisite choreography that we do together. Generally, we, the humans, are leading the dog. Occasionally, if you have a border collie, they are leading us and covering up for some of our handling errors. But it's a very unique choreography. And if the dog does something wrong, I'm going to correct the behavior. I'm going to do something which stops the bad behavior and gets it right again. And if he does something really wrong, I will punish that behavior. So let's say I'm walking forward and then I want to back up with him healing. And as I back up, he's still walking forward. I will say, back up, back up. There's the correction, there's the punishment. If I'm teaching Jamie to ski 
and he's turning left, I say, put your weight on your outside ski. Take your outside knee and lean it in. Keep the rest of your body upright. No, your right leg, your right leg. There's the punishment. He is not running and screaming because I punished him. Is it a punishment? Well, yeah, the next turn he was brilliant. Now he beats me when we ski. That by telling him, that's right, that's right, that's wrong, or the way I like to do it, I don't like to say wrong. A non-instructive punishment is horrible. It's like if I went up to the two ladies in the front row, okay, her and her and her, who's not paying attention to me, and said, no! What have you done wrong? You haven't got a clue, right? What do you think you've done wrong? Yeah, she thinks, looking at you, because she wasn't paying attention. So she wasn't paying attention. How the hell can she learn? No, you know what they've both done wrong? All three of them, they're wearing blue. And I don't like people wearing blue if I have my blue tie on. How are you to know? Well, how are you to know is, yesterday I should have said, tomorrow, no one wears blue. And then, when I come into lecture today, I go around the audience, and I mean, look at this crew. I say, take it off, t-shirt off. Well, maybe not t-shirt off, sorry, ladies. But no blue. You see, and you know exactly what you've done wrong and how to make it right. Of course, whether or not you're going to do it, whether you're going to be a border collie, and you're probably border collies, and you say, T-shirt off, and you run off and put a pink one on and come back and sit down, or whether you do the Rottweiler thing and say, you want this off? Try and take my T-shirt off, buddy. <laughs> but then that's the second bit of lure reward training where now I have to convince you to want to take your blue shirt, T-shirt off. So I put my hand in my wallet and say, for you four people there, a hundred bucks to the first one of you to get your t-shirt off. Boom! I guarantee it'll be this guy. Okay? So, if the punishment is unpleasant. Now, whoa, how do we know if a punishment's unpleasant? That, no, 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 not necessarily. N not at all. It's, how do we know it's a punishment? It works. Brilliant. A tautological definition. But how do we know that the punishment is unpleasant? Okay. And yet we would look at the dog's reaction and we would interpret it. So humans would interpret the dog's reaction. We may hear the dog yelp. We may uh, see the dog put his head down, tail between his legs, see the dog shake. Yeah, but how do we know that the dog's not lying? How many people here have shelters? Uh, probably 50% of shelters have trained their owners to pick them up just by shaking. And this has been trained in by accident, just as many dogs train their owners to cook for them. You know what happens, what, what do you do when you feed your dog? You put down your bowl, and what do you do next? You walk away. Oh, you've done this for seven years, and then one day, you don't walk away. You go, are you okay? Because your dog is doing a cat routine. And he looks at the food and doesn't eat it, for whatever reason. It could be he's been next door and he's eating the dog's food next door and he's, I couldn't eat another river kibble. You know? It could be he's got a tummy upset. But if he delays eating that food a second, every single owner I know goes, Oh, you okay, buddy? You all right? Boom. Huge reward for what? Not eating food. The dog has gotcha. As every Sheltie does. Shelties shake. It's one of the things they do. A little Sheltie one day is shaking. Let's say you're at puppy class. Everyone goes, oh, poor thing, you pick it up. And the Sheltie thinks, God, it's actually cold in here, but that's kind of nice. And then we're walking down the street, you know, and then the street's wet, it's been raining, and the Sheltie says, this is a drag. God, I'm getting my feet wet. Oh, I know. Oh, good, I'm getting a lift now. Okay? So when we see behavior... All we can say for certain is what we see and what the dog does. That's fact. The interpretation is, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, growling is a good example. Um, there's a good two huge reasons to growl, and then a third we put in there. Uh, one is the dog is growling because we presume he doesn't like something. Agreed? The other is the dog's growling because he's playing. The third one is he's growling, we call it learned helplessness. He's learned to growl because growling works. This is great with Rottweilers. Okay? And say you're training them, and you're getting a little frustrated, so now your punishments aren't well-timed, and there's too many of them, 
And then that dog just goes still and goes, a golden retriever would lie down and have its leg up. So two different behaviors, they both learned helplessness. Why? Because they stop you training. And then some people go up to the dog and say, don't you growl at me. So the Rottweiler says, <laughs> if now you ever stop and go, oh, okay, dog's got you. The dog knows now, when I fed up with their training routine, because they aren't going to enough conferences, all I have to do is growl at them and they stop. Okay? So a dog growls, we only assume we know what the motivations are. It could be they're feeling uncomfortable, they're playful, or they've learnt it stops you training. Um, one thing that rodders do, actually, I don't know whether you've ever had this, they growl when you stop petting them. You know, you know, you know you've had a lot of rotters where you go to pet them and they growl, or when you look them in the eyes and they growl. That's pretty standard for the breed. It should actually be in the breed description. You know, that if you look a Rottweiler in the eye, he'll probably growl at you. So number one item on the puppy training agenda is to teach him to love having people look him in the eyes. Because one day on the street, a little child's going to come up and go, Oh, what a big dog, yeah. Mm -hmm. We want the dog to love that, right? We don't want the dog to go, woo, and to start child training lessons. So we know what the dog does. We can only assume how the dog is feeling. So I say, if the punishment is unpleasant, and that in itself is a day's lecture talking about, well, is it really unpleasant? Generally, our assumption is based on, would we think that would be unpleasant if we did it to us? So, like, let's use remote collars. I mean, that's a lot of my judgment. There's 50% of it. I try it on myself, and I think, at this level, actually, now I do not want to go to another level. So, let me uh, do anything you want so I can take this off. However, what I know is my dad, um, he would test the mains in England like this. Well, in England, it's 240 volts. That's what he would do. I got a shock at my house just this year, and I'm not kidding, I was working in the panel, so it's only 110 volts. This blew me backwards over the billiards table. I'm very, very, very sensitive to electricity. And so then it's really stupid, me testing out a shock collar on me and saying, then I won't do this on a dog, because how do I know? Maybe the dog says, give me level eight. Yeah, level seven's nothing, you see? So, we must separate fact from supposition. If the punishment is unpleasant, now we have a significant danger if we give too many. Agreed? Yeah. So, what do we do? Well, I would say two things. Number one, you always ask yourself, is there an alternative way to punish this dog? We ask ourselves the second question, is there actually something we could have done that would actually have prevented the need to punish it at all. Well, not at all. But, you know, could we have, for example, trained the dog to heal <laughs> beforehand? Uh, I would say yes. Um, in my classes, by the way, we have to teach a dog to um, heal on leash. It's a four-step process. Step one is, take your leashes off. The dog has to follow you around the room. I set up little traffic cones with gates. They have to get the dog to follow them. They can use food the first time, then the food's taken away from them, they have to use a toy, then no food and toys. They have to get the dog to walk by their side. And if they can't do that, they aren't putting a leash on the dog. Why? Well, you know what they're going to do, right? If they can't get a dog to walk by their side, let's say tonight. Do we have music tonight? Yeah? We got music tonight? This lady here. Anna. Let's say I go up to Anna and I grab her by a necklace <coughs> and go, dance, now. And I pull her out on the floor by her necklace. Don't you think it would be nice if I came up and said, hi, Ann, would you like to dance? Tango, maybe? Tango? I can lead you. You can dance, Tango? Well, I can lead if you can follow, okay? So we're going to do a little, so we're going to actually have a tango lesson tonight, if you want to do it. This, to me, is it's what it is. It's the dog walking by your side. In Berkeley, there was an old guy. Um, he, well, that was an old guy. He's still an old guy, but he's much older now. But he had a very old border collie. And the border collie was about 14. I'd see him every day, walking down the street. He's probably from Europe. With white hair and a little stick like this. You know, he'd stop and he'd walk on. That border collie was there. No leash. Middle of the city. 
the dog was stuck. And then every time I saw it, it brought tears to my eyes, like, what a couple. And then I started to feel sorry for him because I started talking to him, thinking, this dog's getting old. What's going to happen? Well, dog died. He then got a puppy border collie. Um, it's now walked on leash, which is probably smart. But the, the dog is not stuck to him like glue. It loves him. And, and he still talks to it the same way. And he gives a little tap with the stick if he wants the dog's attention. And the dog looks at him, but it's very wiggly and what have you. So I think, yeah, maybe we could have trained the dog to want to walk by our side before we put on a leash, which then means we're probably going to give a leash correction or tighten up the leash, make it a crutch, or, or, or use the leash to tuck, tuck, tuck as a motivational pop to get him, him moving. Okay, so you always ask those questions, could I have trained the dog first? Is there another way I could punish here? And, and why do we need to ask that? I say the, the, the humane issues don't even come into this equation as far as I'm involved. You're all grown-ups, you can choose how you punish dogs. The reason is, do we want to move to another level of punishment tool, which is now something else we got to phase out to reach criterion? that I'm working with you at the moment and trying to get you to use your voice and say, you're a little girl, you're eight years old. And you're doing okay, but occasionally the dog screws up. I said, what else is new? Do you ever screw up? Yeah, you make mistakes too, right? And your parents are trying to teach you. We all screw up and get it wrong. But you're doing very well controlling this dog off leash using your brain, which is much quicker than mine, and your voice. So do we want to go to a leash? Because once we use the leash in training, we've then got to phase it out. So that's the reason why I'm so reticent about upping the level of punishment tool. All right? Having said that, uh, let me think of a situation where I would go straight to a remote collar. Not me. I would refer the dog to whoever's close who I trust. If it's in Florida, I'd say, see Martin. Uh, this twice, years ago, actually within one week, I had two calls, two different cases, exactly the same problem. Huskies in eastern Colorado that were allowed to roam free and killed sheep. And would I solve the problem for them tomorrow, please? For no money. <laughs> I said, yeah, I can do that. Keep the dog inside. Oh, no, I want him to roam free. So immediately, I think we have very low owner compliance. We have idiots for owners. Um, I'm a farmer. I know what happens when dogs kill sheep. The farmer goes out with a rifle, and the dog gets it straight through the head. Or, if they are an experienced killer, the dog gets it right on the elbow, straight through the heart. But that's a dead dog. It's something that doesn't happen. So I just said, go to this trainer. Let's do some aversive. I actually sent to Dan, Dan Totora, who for me was the godfather of all uh, electrical stimulation collars, because that's what they were originally. They weren't shock at all. There was no pain from it. It was a tickle. That's how it was invented. Go to Dan Totora you will have a resolved problem. Your dog will never kill sheep. He will never approach sheep. However, the poor dog, let's say he's in his garden and a herd of sheep come towards him. You know what that means, right? Every sheep says, you're going to get shocked. You're going to get shocked. You're going to get shocked. Bah, bah. You now have a dog which is in so much stress should sheep come up. Um, a more common example of this is people who will use severe punishments when dogs then say, lunge at children. If we aren't careful, the punishment can be negative classical conditioning, which is associated with the child. We now go and walk the dog to a shopping center. He's surrounded by children. Every time he sees a child, you see, it means don't approach a shock, don't approach shock. You get the idea? So my reticence to go on to a higher level of punishment is I don't want another thing to phase out. Simple as that. I want to train the dog as quickly as possible. I do not want to take, and we got that arch in, in you know, 70 years, for me to get an arch, it would take 270. I would be dead before my dog got an arch. It's, it's not my gig. I'm not that good. I don't want to keep going to a dog show every week. I'd rather watch soccer. Does anyone have a computer, by the way? Could you, someone at the end of this, do a big deal for me and go to Fox Sports and check the Euro 2008 results? Uh, uh, they're not, are they? <coughs> Shit. 
So. Yeah, that was, that was pretty nasty. That was shocking. All right. Um, so. Again, what has, he in, what has he not said? Did he say punishments are wrong? No, punishments are essential. You cannot have a reliable dog to criterion without using punishments. Got it? It's a fact. Um, for me, in training, the quadrant doesn't exist. You've heard the quadrant, right? We argue about the quadrant. We have fights about the quadrant rather than actually training dogs. It's ridiculous. The quadrant only applies to long-term rewards and long-term punishments. Agreed? Can you, anyone confused by that? Good. Um, so the negative punishment and negative reinforcement only apply negative punishment if you have a long-term good time. Say the dog's playing, he does something wrong, time out. You can only time out if he's been doing something pleasurable for a long time. Agreed? Negative reinforcement. The old age classic example was the ear pinch. You can only take the pressure off the ear pinch if you've been pinching the ear for a long time. Or a better example of negative reinforcement, uh, whispering. You've all seen the horse whispering thing, right? The circular paddock. And what you do here is you have a horse who doesn't like people, he's scared of people, so you pressure him. How do you pressure a horse? Simple. You just walk towards him. If you walk towards his rear end, he'll go forwards. If you walk towards his front end, he will back up. So what you do is you just walk towards or look at his rear end. The horse will go forwards. He's in a circular corral. Where does he go? He circles. You keep looking at his butt. He circles, he circles, he circles. He's under pressure, 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 pressure. Eventually, he's, I can't take this anymore. The horse lowers his head and sticks out his tongue. Yeah, same kind of same as the dog. Stick out your tongue, which says, I've had enough of this. Please give me a break. As soon as you see the horse's head go down, his tongue come out, you turn your back and walk away. The horse comes and follows you. He joins up. It's a wonderful example of negative reinforcement. One that the general public, of course, thinks is magic. And whispering, and we don't have this nasty word punishment associated with it. However, in order to negatively reinforce, we have to have been punishing for a long time. Now, if you were smart and you're doing negative reinforcement, and I'll give you the one time I use it is when a dog uh, doesn't do the distance sit. I'm teaching that, so rover sit. Rover sit, 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 sit. Good boy. Negative reinforcement. I stop the instructive reprimand, the repetitive command, if you like, sit, sit, sit. When the dog tells me I'm going to sit, and then I say, good dog. Positive reinforcement. Oh, Jesus, what have we just got there? We got three bits of the quadrant all happening at the same time within half a second. You had positive reinforcement. Okay, sorry. You had um, positive punishment. Sit, 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 sit. Negative reinforcement. I stop shouting at the dog. And then positive reinforcement. Good dog. So this whole quadrant thing, to me, it, it's bull. And it only applies to long-term good times or long-term bad times. And that, to me, is not 5% of training. 95% of training is lightning strike rewards and punishments. Like that. Each one telling the dog, thank you. <laughs> Each one telling the dog, that was right, that was right, that was really good, that was right, that was wrong, that was wrong, that's right, that's right, that's wrong, that's wrong. Okay? I wrote down here in Japan last year in a workshop, we had a dog, a bull terrier, that was bullying a um, long-haired Dachshund, miniature Dachshund. Uh, for pretty standard, off-leash class behavior, right? This whole bully thing. Uh, what people are doing now is horrible. They're avoiding the problem. They are separating classes into little dog classes and big dog classes. They are time-outing the dogs for five or ten minutes. Well, it's rubbish. That's not training a dog. You've got a problem. Now, personally, I thought these dogs were just playing. But the owner of both of them thought the bull terrier is bullying the little Dachshund. Who's the trainer here? Me. Who has to solve this problem now? Me. Why? Because do we think it's going to be better next week? No. This is the craziness. You're doing a puppy class. Here's a problem the owner presents to you and you ignore it. 
You've got to solve this problem this week because next week it'll be more serious and the next week more serious still. And when you're talking a five-month-old dog, you've got a big problem now. So I said, we talked to them and I said, well, I think the dogs are playing. I think I can prove it to you. So I held the bully, the bull terrier, and let the other dogs run. What happens? The little long head dash and runs up and says, play with me, play with me. This is the acid test where you can ask one dog, how do you feel? It's called preference testing in dogs. That's what I did for 10 years in research. Do you prefer this urine to that urine? So I give the little Dachshund and a chance. You want to run and hide, run and play with another dog, or come up and play with this bull terrier that I'm holding. And out of the class of 10 other puppies, the little Dachshund said, I want to play with the bull terrier. So I would say, I don't think this is bullying. However, you want to stop it. So for the bull terrier's sake, let's do it. So I dogged the dog for three and a half minutes, which means if there's a bully in class... Owners become really exasperated with their dog. If there's a bully in class, I'm saying, shut up! Then I realize it was me. Dogs when they won't come... <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what, let's just show the DVD now, right? Then you can turn it off. Yeah, show it. Are you all right? You ready to show it? From the top. Just press play. Sure? I'll come back to this, yeah. I can hold a thought. <laughs> Let's see what we have. Is it coming? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to put pressure on you. Other owners become really exasperated with their dogs when they won't come when called, when distracted by other dogs and cats and squirrels and rabbits and such. They get real annoyed with the dog and ultimately they give up training because they think it's impossible. Well, it is possible. We can prove it right here. Good girl. Good girl. Hey, come on. Good little girl. That rabbit would have proved too tempting for most dogs. But at Little Owl's Kennels near Wimborne, Martin Dealey uses penned rabbits to teach his gun dogs to resist temptation right from the start. Sit. Not every pet owner has a rabbit pen in the bottom mm. of their garden, so how can they start about proofing their dogs mm. um, off squirrels and cats and rabbits and what have you when they're walking the dog in the park? What would you suggest there? I, I think the first thing is always to have control. And I think, you know, you can have so much fun from playing and training your dog with balls and dummies and things like that. So anything bouncing, don't send them straight away. Teach them to wait. Teach them control mm -hmm. on this. You can make an ordinary walk into a fascinating training session. And all you do is say, sit, throw a ball behind you, stop it, ah, you go and pick it. You go and pick the ball yourself, come on back, he's a good lad. Then on, throw a ball, ah, when he sits this time, send him for it. Good lad. And as you're going through the park and so forth, you can often see squirrels ahead of people. Or if you're walking in the countryside, you'll get rabbits that come out from the hedgerow, just out, you'll see them ahead. Bring your little dog in, walk it to heel, walk up close, as soon as it flushes, ah, sit. Good boy, good mm -hmm. lad. If it shows interest, no. Just a good mm -hmm. boy. So be prepared, look ahead. Look ahead. And say sit as soon as yeah. anything bad's going to happen. When would you start this off? Straight away. Straight away. The first, I, uh, very first walk. Um, you see, I get dogs in here and the owner says, uh, my dog chases and I can't do anything to stop it. And the problem is that the loud, everybody seems to think a dog ought to have a lot of free running. Let it run, let it run, let it run. And it goes out of perhaps what I call brake distance, and that means breaking mm -hmm. away from you, not breaking, yeah. stopping. It goes out of that particular distance, and no matter what you do, it's going to chase. All of a sudden, a rabbit comes up, chases that. Much more fun out there than being with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So why should it come back to you until I finish chasing? Yeah. Thank you very much. But mm -hmm. if the pleasure comes from being with you and everything you do with you, you know, it should all kind of beam from your being. Hey, what's it going to do next mm -hmm. to give me pleasure? You can start to relax a little bit then. And once you've got that in, and I would say with most dogs, I don't think a dog has got the habits until 18 months, two years mm -hmm. minimum. Yeah, certainly. And even then you can put bad ones into it. And three years for the real big breeds. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I think you've got to really work at it. And you see, we take a dog in here six months old. We probably have it for six months, a year old. The owner has got to be taught then to maintain those habits. Yeah. To maintain that control. Because if that owner goes out and says, oh, it's a lovely feel, let it have a run. 
and it runs 150, 200 yards, finds a rabbit, off it goes. Owner doesn't see it. One mistake and That's undoes right. all that training. You see the other thing as well with a spaniel, if you're hunting a spaniel close and it finds a rabbit close to you, it thinks every rabbit is close to the boss. Yeah. If mm -hmm. you let it run 100 yards and it finds a rabbit 100 yards away, it says every rabbit's 100 yards away. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep it close, oh, there's, a, there's a good lad. Hey, this man can supply me with what I want. The other thing, if you think about it, people say it needs exercise, it needs to run. Well, why not get it interested in retrieving, drop a ball, walk on 50 yards, walk on 10 yards, send it back for it. Mm -hmm. Build it at 50, build it at 100. I used to have a retriever and I could actually walk around a place called Badbury Rings near here. I could walk half the way around, which must have been, what, quarter of a mile or more? Drop a ball, walk around, send him back. And I used to wait. He'd go running off back, mm -hmm. come back with it every time. And that was the exercise. And he thought this was great fun. Yeah. Pleasure comes from you, not yeah. from doing its own thing. Yeah. Uh, training is pleasure for the dog. It's not hard work. It's not something that you're punishing the dog or making it do something. Generally, with a dog and training a gun dog, particularly, you're bringing out its natural instincts. I think if you're training any dog, you're bringing out yeah. its natural instincts. Uh, a dog is a hunter. Uh, a dog likes to search for game, it likes to locate game or scent of some nature. If it pushes something out, it likes to chase it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we go out and uh, you say, hunt on, it's a controlled hunting. It's hunting within a particular distance. If you say, fetch it, that's the chase. But he doesn't go until you tell him to. Uh -huh. yeah. So when he goes, he thinks, hey, this is great, this is fun, this is what I'm made for. But he goes when you tell him. So he said, it's a control of their natural instincts and bringing it out so they enjoy it. So okay, when you go control, through that, then the dog has freedom. And I'm leaving this for well. Martin because he ain't probably he's probably never seen this, you know. Um, and it was quite a while ago, as you can tell by how young we both looked back then. Um, and I hope you're counting rewards and punishments. Um, and, and the reason is his ratio is higher than mine. His reward to punishment ratio is better than mine when I'm training. The sheer number of rewards there, it's, it's, you can barely count them. You know, every time a dog comes in, he's hit with about nine rewards. Oh, he's a good boy. Good lad, good lad, good lad. And the stroking, the hands, bomb. It's like the dog does a good behavior, nine rewards. And you saw the punishments, right? Uh, let's go back to the beginning. You remember the beginning of the little Labrador? He throws the ball, and the Labrador goes, I'm going to chase that. And then you see the punishment. Martin makes a little sound, like, ah, very soft, turns around and goes the other way. Now the dog has to walk away from the ball. There's your punishment, working really beautifully. You didn't hear the word premac, did you? No, this is great advice. It's given in pet owner language, total premac. We are training this dog to retrieve tennis balls, bumpers, and pheasant wings in a rabbit pen of distractions. Same principle as puppy class. Let them off leash. You're going to train your dog off leash in this play session. So the very first sit you get will be an off leash sit in a play session of 12 puppies. Damn. Well, we won't ever have to phase out the leash, will we, in training? We won't ever have to train the dog in distractions. You threw the dog into the distraction, and then when he sits, what do you say? Go play. Absolute total premac. Okay? What you say here is, go fetch. Okay? Um, the stuff about the bunnies walking, the dog is now thinking bunnies are controlled by my owner. It's rabbits close to me. Um, I used to do this with squirrels all the time. In the park, you see a squirrel, rover sit. And you check it out, you think, yeah, it's pretty safe. And you say to the dog, with Oso, this is amazing, you say, Oso, you see the squirrel? See the squirrel? Oso, down. Oso, sit. Go get it. Off he goes, 70 yards away. Very safe, because what's the squirrel going to do? Up a tree, so your dog's going to be right there at the bottom of the tree. What a reward, okay? So that's yours, Martin, thank you. Now the next bit is, we have this dog, level four biter, again. Um, owners just come out of hospital, putting husband and wife in hospital. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, it's... I think there's a chapter, you can go to the chapter, if you go to scene selection, it's the second, there's only two chapters there. I think I put it in. Um, I hope I put it in after I had you pause it there. Thank you. And um, they want to keep the dog. They love the dog. Um, if you shout at the dog, he will go off on you. If you reach for the dog's collar, he is going off on you. 
with me. He always liked me from the beginning, and I did loads and loads of, you know, I'll touch the collar, treat, touch the collar, treat, touch. So with me, he's really cool, and I only once had problems with him when stupidly um, he's starting to act up, and I grab him by the collar. Uh, it's just a stupid move, Ian. I should have used my voice, kept my hand off him, but whatever. They want to keep the dog. He's out of control. So what we're doing is a little exercise. I'm coming in, ringing the doorbell, making noise, and she's meant to keep the dog on the bed. Okay? She can't shout at the dog, but she's got to punish it because it's not doing what she wants. We've shown the dog what we want him to do. Go to your bed, lie down, here's some food. We've been pretty nice. But when we do the doorbell thing, the dog just loses it and comes running. Now, it's me that's there, so it's quite safe because he's not going to bite me. So he just comes running up, but he's out of control. So she's got to get control. Remember the first word out of Martin's mouth? Control. That's all I care about. I really don't give a damn about this dominance thing. I don't even care if the dog is dominating me or thinks he is. What I care about is control. If I say sit, does the dog sit? Fine. Then I don't care what he's thinking. If I say give me a kiss, he gives me a kiss. If I say walk by my side, he walks by my side. All I care about is control. If I ask the dog to do something, does he do it? If he doesn't, my first assumption is, I don't think I've trained him enough. Let's go back and retrain him. If I want to hurry things up, then the number of punishments increases over the number of rewards. So, for example, in the fighting dog video, um, you will see me punish the dog with the on-leash aggression. And I just go, whoa, whenever he lunges. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm doing pure classical conditioning. It's not working yet. It takes about 20 trials, and the producer says, Ian, we've been doing this for half an hour. Nothing's happening. Make it happen. I said, all right, I'll make it happen. So I bring in punishments. It speeds it up, but I damage the dog in the process. You look at that little Ollie. Oliver. I shout at him and his head goes down and you would assume and I would assume that dog is really pissed off with Ian. So after the session I actually told the owner, I said, I want to take your dog for a walk. You know, I, I, I screwed up with him. It's, it's great. Wonderful illustration of how to punish. The timing is immaculate. I'm so fast with my voice and it works. And now we have a dog that a year later is playing with other dogs in the park. So quality of life. Okay, I shouted at him. Okay, I pissed him off and frightened him, but now he runs free and plays with other dogs. His quality of life has really expanded. But I felt bad that I did what I did. I didn't train the way I normally trained because I was on TV. I changed it to speed it up, and that wasn't fair to the dog or the owner. So now I go back, repair the damage. Just took one walk. I went on a walk, and I had a bag of treats. After that, the dog loved me. Okay. Um, following around this bull terrier, in three and a half minutes, my feedback rate to the dog was over 60 a minute. I want you to think of that. 60 feedbacks per minute. So that's total feedback rewards and punishments. It came out to 133 rewards. So in three and a half minutes, this little bull terrier got 133. Ooh, good dog, good dog. Oh, he's a good boy, good boy, good boy. Oh, yeah. Ah, ah, ah. And he got 19 punishments. Of, and by the Japanese student, I asked them, you count these, and as I did it. And of these 19 punishments, um, most of them were ah, just a guttural sound. And some of them were off, off, or sit. So they were instructive reprimands, so the dog knew what to do. There were five timeouts, uh, ranging from two to five seconds which means I've gone like, where's a good boy? Good boy, uh, he's a good boy. Uh, off, 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 off. Doesn't work. Well, I've maxed out on my voice, so what do I do? Grab the collar. And I say, hey, buddy, excuse me. Yeah, you listen to me, all right? Good, okay, go play. There's a good boy. Good boy, good boy. That's it, sniff, off, off, off. Ah, 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 ah. Good boy, good boy. You get the idea? So in three and a half minutes, um, at a feedback rate of 60 a minute, 133 rewards, 19 punishments. When I quantified Martin's tape, it was 10 to 1. That's a higher ratio. That is so cool. That is so cool. I have no idea where it is there. I threw away. I don't know which one it is. Probably two. Yeah, it's two. It's two. And it's called doorbells, I think, or front door visits or something. Yeah. So, um, Extraordinary. 
I would be really happy with a three to one ratio when watching someone train. That um, for every one time they punish the dog, three times they say good dog. Okay? And, and this, to me, is what makes, say, Martin an extraordinary... Oh, a Very trail. nice. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I thought we had sound. Um, and so, um, I would say, you know, it's really good. You aim for the best. I think 10 to 1 is a good thing to aim at. However, it's human nature. And what do we know about human nature? <laughs> You're damn right there. The number one human foible that totally messes with our lives is we take the good for granted and we moan and groan at the bad. We cannot say thank you if our life depended on it. You know, when you're picked up at the airport, you don't say thank you. When you serve dinner at the table, you don't say thank you. If dinner's late one day or we have beans twice in a row, oh, mum, not beans again. It's like ignore, 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 moan. Ignore, 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 moan. And when someone's late, we moan. You never say, oh, thank you for coming on time. Actually, I do to my wife because I only say that about once every 10 times, because she's usually late. But this is my reward training program of trying to reinforce her for being on time. So we want to go for that. Are we close? Yep, we're done. Play it. On your bed. Good dog. So we've come in Stay. when this is already playing. The doorbell's already rung. I think I'll just sit and... Briscoe bed. Briscoe bed. Briscoe bed. On your bed. On your bed. Down. Good dog, Briscoe. Stay. Good dog. So nice stay. down. Good praise for Good lying dog. down. Stay. Hello. How's it going? On your bed. Briscoe bed. Briscoe on your bed. Briscoe bed. Good dog. Good dog, Briscoe. I'm really trying. I'm just trying to calm him down a bit before I move and sit down. Then she's got to keep him there. Good dog. And I'm going to intentionally do things to make him move. And keep him here. So you may have to just say Briscoe bed again. So you would be timing the downstay, good, counting every time the dog breaks. Are we improving with this dog? Because it's been, it's not good training at the moment, is it? Go to your bed, go to your bed, go to your bed, okay. go to your bed. Do Five one. commands and the dog does it. So I want to show that the dog can do it with three commands the next time, or two commands. We've got to show improvement. Now she lets the dog get up again. You see, she's losing before she begins. As soon as the Briscoe dog got bed. up, she should have said, on your bed, on your bed, bed. right away. Bed. Briscoe on your bed. Briscoe bed. So if you like, this is kind of like a oh, battle bed. of wills at all the moment. Good She's dog. just saying, Stay. I'm going to keep dog. telling you to go to your bed until you do. End of story. How's and he's saying, I'm not going to do it. I never had to do it in the past. Ah, but this time, Briscoe you're going to end up on your bed lying down. So insistence is probably the best bed. word for it. Dog. Gentle, soft, calm, insistent. Briscoe. Oh, you're trying too hard. Some dogs are too advanced. What do you think? I've got a food treat for you? I don't know why you think that. Hmm? What makes you think I've got a food treat? See? I don't. God, he's too smart for me. He's too smart for me. Very good dog. Oh, we mustn't touch if we want it. That's a good dog. I'm very impressed. I'm utterly, completely impressed. Take it. Good dog. That's very good. So as soon as I stand up, you can have to watch him again. Come sit down. I'm trying to train her when the dog That's will good. break. If I stand up, it's going to break. So how's things been? Things are good. <laughs> Since I saw you last, things are good. I know. Good. 
How's your cold? He's yawning there a little, and that shows he's just a teeny weeny bit stressed. Trying to be cute so here, he's he's taking her mind yeah. off the dog. So I should give it to yeah, him? Good no, she boy, missed Bruce. the yawn. being a good dog. Yeah. Not rewarding well, him for lying down. Not. He's being good now. Good boy, Should be Briscoe. good, Briscoe. He's good a good boy. Dog. There's a He's good, a good dog. dog. Pretty nice praise coming well out there. Well behaved, handsome, and intelligent beast. Oh my goodness! That's good. Are you blushing? And again, you time the downstay. This is a dog that didn't have a downstay, by the way. Good dog, Briscoe. It's a good boy. Briscoe bed. See how Bristol slow she bed. is. It's a full second. She Down. totally misses that the dog's going to get bed. up, and then a Good second job. goes by. Good, Good job. If she'd been okay. phrasing more, it probably wouldn't have Relax happened. Good bed. Nice lie down on your bed. And he's about well, to move the bed. Always wants Thank to be you. Get back on your on bed. The alert Good boy. When he eventually relaxes and chills, and then. Good boy. Okay. So very, be first. very gentle praise. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's Good. Yeah. What a good dog, Briscoe. Well, what you're looking for is him going on his side, his back, or chin down on the floor. Okay. And that gets good praise from you. And then doesn't give a treat. It's too late then. Okay. Yeah. I think you have some idea. So with dogs like this, you must have your clock watch running, your stopwatch. So you can say, that's not bad, that's a two minute downstay. Do you know how long a downstay we did to this dog in the evening? They paid me, she's a cook, a gourmet cook. She cooked dinner for me. Five hour downstay we did with this dog while she cooked his dinner. The dog broke 22 times, but it remained on that bed for five hours controlled only by her voice. And the kitchen was another place. People. The owners got bit when guests came. You know, dogs bouncing and they grab it by the front door and in the kitchen. So that's why we did the cooking the meal right, thing. That's nice. we'll do it again. The dog could be a part of it lying down by the door. And she cooked dinner without having to put the dog away. And then when I started drinking, I said, lock the dog up. I'm, no, I'm turning my brain off now. So lock the dog up. I'm not drinking and training this dog. He's too spooky. The trial three. Briscoe bed. You count how many seconds? Two seconds before she gets on the dog's case. Still not doing it. She should have known it was going to happen and said, you stay on the bed, okay? Don't you move from that bed. Dog moves. Get back on the bed right away. Get back on the bed. On the bed. On the bed. Sweet, but some urgency. That's a very good dog, Briscoe. What a good boy. Now, this is the first time I can get in without him breaking from the bed a second time. Improvement. You see, we've quantified you're getting somewhere. He goes crazy when the doorbell rings, you get him on the bed, but now he stays on the bed while the person comes in. By quantifying, you can show to the owner, see, he's improving. You don't get it. And that makes them feel That's so good. good and will make them do very their homework. Very okay, very we can good. stop that. Good. So, yesterday we were there talking about um, leash corrections and how 25 years ago at the Oakland Dog Training Club uh, they were not reducing over a two-week period, meaning the dogs obviously aren't learning anything. Therefore, meaning that the punishments, the leash corrections, were not punishments by definition. So they were just an annoyance to the dog, whatever they were, but they weren't changing the dog's behavior. And then we went in to say, why do dogs get leash corrections? Over 50% of corrections are from forging, and about 40% are from lagging. And both of these behavior problems are the antidote for the other problem. So what I like to do in training is, if there's a problem, put it on cue. Then yo-yo the problem behavior with the behavior that you want. Okay? So at this workshop, at the Dog and Bone Show, we started off, jazz up, settle down, jazz up, settle down. Then we taught the dogs to bark and shush. Bark and shush. Imagine that, 80 dogs outside, all barking or shushing, or barking or shushing. Then we taught the dogs to pull on leash and walk by your side. And by the way, to teach a dog to pull on leash, very difficult exercise. Really, you know, if you can do that, you're a really good dog trainer. It's hard because whatever you say brings the dog back to you. Like if you punish the dog or go, ah, the dog will stop pulling and look at you. But if you say, good boy, he slows down, his face comes up and he stops pulling. 
Okay? So it's really a hard thing to do with one trainer. Pretty easy to do with a lure out front, like someone walking another dog, so he's got a butt to you know, pull towards, or someone with a food treat or a tug of war toy. Okay? Put the problem on cue, yo-yo it with what you don't want. So, walking with your dog aside, tell him, go on, forge, forge. Tell him to move ahead. Go on, move, move, move. Okay? Tell him to slow down. How do we train that in? Really easy. Simple lure reward training. I'm not going to do it here because I'll, I'll trip up. Basically, four things, right? Request, lure, response, reward. The request, let's say, is hustle and steady. Hustle means speed up, steady means slow down. The lure is me. So I'm walking along, I want you to watch the timing. You will not see my speed change until after I've given the instruction. So I'm walking along with the dog and I say, Rover, hustle. Whoa, good boy, good boy, good boy. Rover, steady. Whoa, boom, boom, boom. So I say hustle, speed up, steady, slow down, and the dog learns very quickly. Damn, you know, when he says hustle, he's gone, Jesus. I mean, I get my head ripped off, you know, if I were on leash. And when he says steady, it's like he just hits the brakes. Now, if you walk at the same speed and say hustle, yep, the dog speeds up. Steady, the dog slows down. Now, you can make the leash, instru leash correction instructive. So now, before you ever give a leash correction, okay, you say hustle, pop. It now changes the leash correction from a punishment to what type of learning? It's not punishment training, it is aversive learning. Uh, sorry, it is... <laughs> <laughs> I think I need another beer. I mean water. Do you have any more water? I'm feeling dehydrated. Um, it's avoidance learning, which is so much smarter. Why is it so much smarter? Dog, you're giving the dog a choice to get it right and avoid the punishment or get it wrong and get punished. Punishment training is really dumb if you think about it because the punishment happens after the behavior. So it's like you're sitting around waiting for the dog to misbehave, then you punish it. I mean, it's really dumb, isn't it? Because the behavior's, bad behavior has already happened. The great thing about avoidance training is now you're taking training by the horns, the long horns and saying, you know what, you aren't going to pull on leash anymore. I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you first, and you have a choice. And what you'll find is, every time you warn the dog, what are you going to do? Let, let's see. Everyone think about this. Don't answer the question. Let's see what we have got from the lecture yesterday and today. Every time you say hustle, what are you going to do? At the end of the training session, then, what are you going to do? you are going to count how many times you said hustle, number one. So how many problems did we have where we had to warn the dog? And of all the times we had to warn the dog, what percentage of the time did we have to punish it? Uh -uh. And what has to happen to that percentage? It should decrease from day to day. So now you know the dog is learning and within your criterion is, now I just give the instructive reprimand and say hustle and the dog speeds up. Okay? And the hustle could be a, such a subtle warning. Okay? Uh, really subtle. What I normally do, uh, or what I did when I competed in obedience, was I took, if the dog is lagging, I took a slightly longer step. And this is something one judge noticed and came up to me. He says, you're doing something funny, Dr. Dunbar, but I, I don't know what it is. I mean, you have to understand, I was on thin ice with my Malamute. I mean, I did not know what I was doing, and it's why I did competitive obedience. So I could feel it and, and give answers to problems. But a lady in the ring before me, early in the morning, had a little dachshund, and she was healing like this, and then he said, fast. And she's doing this until she starts moonwalking. Because, the, you know, she's <laughs> compensating for the dachshund slowing down. What I did is exactly the opposite. See, the long step is, is used a lot, actually, in obedience, in footwork, a long step before every turn. The long step says to the dog, something different is going to happen. A long step, and then I'm going to do a turn, okay? My long step says, something's going to happen. I'm either going to shoot off over there so fast you can't believe it, or slow down. So when you do the long step, the dog looks at you. 
Um, we just, uh, there's a wonderful piece of footage. I tell you, you can watch this. Um, we have a new website that should go live tomorrow. It's called Dog Star Daily. What I've decided to do, um, well, you'll see what I've been doing over the past two months when you see the 200 videos I put on this site for free viewing. And we have a beautiful bit of footage there with Ollie, who, bless his heart, died three weeks ago. And I'm reward training to walk on leash. It's beautiful. It's on a stage doing a demo, and you'll see the long step. So um, he's on leash, and I taught him to walk on leash and automatically sit to look at me, you only saying the words, good dog. Okay, just reward training, which means you don't lure, um, you don't punish, you don't tell the dog what you want him to do, you let the dog work it out. Dog Star Daily. So it's based on an English tabloid paper, you know, red tabloid. And it's a multi-blog site, so we're going to have eventually 100 bloggers from around the world. Um, and at the moment, there's 200 videos up there. And as soon as it's running properly, I'm just going to, all of my videos I'm having live up on the site. Because I'm not lecturing anymore. You know, I've got done no more multi-day lectures in the US. My last one in the UK is in a couple of months. And I think, what a shame. So I think, let's just put it up there. And eventually, all the DVDs will be up there. And I want to talk to you about this. Um, rather than, you know, shipping DVDs to people, they should just be up there. You can sell to anyone in the world at any time, pay to download. So we need to talk about that. So it's going to be a really fun site, but you'll see this little clip, and it's called something like Reward Training Walk on Leash or, or, or something. And you'll see the long step. Every time I take the long step, it's a slow long step, the dog goes, what's happening? And looks up at me. And then, of course, most of the time I take the long step, I stand still, so he looks and then he sits. Okay, so we must make our punishments instructive. If you are giving a non-specific, non-instructive punishment, it is very difficult for the dog to learn. You apply this to everything, whether you're using your voice, much better than going no or ah, which tells the dog what? That's wrong. It's to say to the dog, sit, sit. Thank you. To re-instruct. Okay. I used to do a demo at workshops. I can't do it now. My brain is too slow. But I used to have three color cards in front of the table. And I asked someone to come up. Okay. And then I have three hand signals. You got them? Red, blue, green. And I do this. And you've got to hit the right card. And if you hit the wrong card, okay, you hit the blue one, I go, no! And then I do this again. The owner just goes, oh, shit. And they can't do anything. If, on the other hand, you know, I do this and you hit the blue card, red. Oh, the speed of the recorrection is so fast. So when you're put in this seat as the dog now, you understand what a non-specific punishment is like. All you know is you're doing something wrong. So, before a leash correction, before an, an electric zap, Tell him something. Give him the instructive reprimand. You need a counter on your collar. And if we have collar manufacturers here, they should make them now with counters on. So at the end, end of any training session, you should say, oh, this is fantastic. 12 electric shocks in one hour. Yesterday, I had 42. When I first started with this dog, I had 100. You see what I mean? It, it, you know, again, not saying this is wrong. I'm saying how you should use it properly. And what you've got to work out now is every time you give the instructive reprimand, so you say blow the whistle or whatever, so you go beep, which means sit. If the dog doesn't sit initially, I would go beep, zap. And then you're calculating how many times did I have to give the extra long beep, the instructive reprimand, or I would do it with my voice, sit. And how many times do you then have to follow up with the punishment? Both of those should be decreasing over time. If they are, bingo, you're training. Soon, you'll just be left with, what will the dog learn? You know, when they go, beep, it's now, it's, this is where consistency comes in. When they go, beep, without a doubt, if I sit, it's followed by a, good boy, go hunt again. Or if I don't sit, it is always followed by a, beep, zap. Okay? As learning progresses, we find that now beeps 
are followed consistently, say 60% of them, by beep. But now we're down to only 20% of shocks following the long beep. Eventually there's zero shocks, eventually there's zero long beeps. You understand? Yeah. So all I'm saying here is, well, I say all I'm saying, th this is such important advice, um, no one has done it. The first dog trainers, um, I'm, I'm saying this to the APDT, I'm saying it to you, the first dog trainer who does research on dog training will become very famous. There is zero information out there on this. How do you do a research study? Well, you could do this. Let's say every week in class, you, and puppy class, it's off leash, adult class, it's on leash, you tie the leash to an eye hook in the floor, and every week you have the owner come up to the dog um, and they go sit, down, sit, stand, down, stand. And you count the number of commands and the number of responses. Additionally to doing this, sit, bomb, down, bomb, they do it like this. Which dogs learn very quickly, so easy. But also they do this, rover sit, down, sit. You work out how many commands are given. So, Rover, sit. 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 So that took three sits to get one response. We're at 33%. You do it every week in every class with every dog. You log it. Then you graph it out week by week. That's a research study. That's all you do. Just three classes you follow through. That's 36 dogs. What you now know is, what are, when are you achieving your criteria in class? And you say, well, week one, everyone's got this. Sit, down, sit, stand, down, stand. Everyone's got that. But it's probably week two before they've got the hand signals only. It's week six before they've got the verbal commands only. But they've got it at week six. No one has proved this. No one at all. And I don't, I don't care what method you use. That's a study. That's what you now do. What you then do after that is say, I want to improve that criterion. I don't want to have them getting verbal commands on the six position changes at week six. I want it on week three. You see what I mean? That's the whole point of quantifying is to set your personal best as a dog trainer. But you need hard facts according to how well you are doing. We could do a 30 second sit stay, a one minute down stay. Simple stuff. But you're doing it each week. How many dogs can do it? In the 30 second down stay, how many times did they break? How many commands were given? How many times did they reward the dog? How many times did they have to correct the dog? You're gathering data, okay? All right, let's just go through very quickly then. I would say we've gone through a number of the important things about punishment. Uh, one is, as you said, um, it has to be punishing. It has to be effective, all right? Doesn't have to be painful. Doesn't have to be that scary. Um, think Briscoe here, yeah, he was not scared by that, but his behavior improved over time. So we know whatever we're doing is acting like a punishment. So first, we always check, did it work? If you're using rewards, I don't see the point of continuing what you're doing if it doesn't work. You're wasting your time. The dog's having a great time, but you're wasting your time. With punishments, I think we do owe it to the dog to count every time we punish, to prove to ourselves that the number of punishments decreases day to day, and therefore we prove to ourselves the punishment worked. A punishment should be instructive. This is so huge. Very easy if you're using your voice. Um, I have a number of instructive punishments. You know, outside. Kong. Oh, sorry. Squirrel dude. It, sorry, Kong was just so programmed in my brain there. But then, uh, oh, Kong's here, yeah, Kong. Jesus, why should I say squirrel, dude? I forgot you're here. So always with my dogs, they're, they're licking on the furniture. Kong. Straight up, okay, I'll chew my Kong. And then I think we better stuff some more Kongs to get them proofed in. Uh, if they're about to pee on the carpet, outside. If the dog farts on the couch, outside. If the dog squabble when on the couch, that's not allowed. I don't mind if they squabble on the floor, but if they're on human furniture and they squabble, dogs outside. In our office, we had seven dogs, and two dogs squabble, all seven had to go outside. 
And then we would run to the window and look at them. They're all standing side by side like, can we come in? It's raining here. Okay? So the instructive reprimand, sit, is probably the number one instructive reprimand that I use. Now, I'll finish this very quickly and then there's two questions I know people want to ask. Um, if you're using a non-specific punishment tool, the leash correction, um, or uh, electric shock, make it instructive by using your voice beforehand. It will surprise you how many times you actually don't have to jerk the leash or hit the button, because the dog is now responding to your voice. And that is the ultimate criterion, right? Voice control or whistle control. Uh, blah, 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 blah. The punishment should be immediate. I mean, the glaring errors in this lady here. Two-second punishment delay. How effective is the punishment now when she gives it? 20% as effective after two seconds. Which means what? The punishment has to be five times as strong to have the equivalent effect if you delay just two seconds. Crime punishment. Crime punishment. As quickly as that. Okay? Um, brrr, let the punishment fit the crime. The dog just snapped at another dog, you know. He didn't sink his teeth into a baby's face. So he snaps at another dog and, oh, quit it, you stupid dog. That's the level of the punishment. You know, no damage done. The dog did nothing, no different from what most dog trainers do when they're talking on the lists. They snapped at each other. It's like, shit, give him a break. You don't cream a dog just because he snaps at another dog. Okay? But you've got to punish him. Tell him, knock it off. What do you think you're doing? Okay? Um, I, really, I really love seeing my wife when she's proofing the dogs not to go into the street. It's so funny how, you know, she does the thing, walk to here and sit and wait and goes and pulls on the leash, sit and then she tricks them into it. And one day she just walks out straight into the street and the dog steps over the line. And she goes, oh, oh. Oh, good boy. And it's like she's having a little heart attack. Then when the dog steps off the street again, oh, good boy, thank you, yes. And you see the expression on the dog's face like, God, did I cause that heart attack? Oh, my God. So, it's got to be immediate. Let the punishment fit the time. Keep it short. If you're using negative reinforcement, um, you're on thin ice. It means you've got a lengthy positive punishment. Um, you better make sure you know what you're doing. And you better make sure you don't give up. Uh, I saw once a lady with a golden retriever, this was, oh, 30 years ago, ear pinching the golden to do a forced retrieve. Um, and the dog learnt it really quickly. And then she went to a Springer Spaniel and tried it. And the Springer screamed and bit her. And she let go. She has now negatively reinforced the dog to scream and bite. And what do we know about negative reinforcement? Shit, that dog's trained. Oh my God, that behavior's in there. That's why you do it, okay? And so if you're going to use negative reinforcement, you're going to use a lengthy positive punishment, you've got to acknowledge you cannot give up. So, for example, with a tantrum dog that's screaming and biting, I know I'm going to grab him, but I know I can't give up. So, and we have this beautiful on footage with a shepherd I'm filming an adult class the other day. And so I grab the dog by the back of his collar and this goes around his brisket and his back comes up against me and I go down on the ground. My face, I've got to protect every part of my body. Both my hands have to be out of reach and I'm going to hug him until the tantrum stops. When the tantrum stops, oh, he's a good boy, let go. So then what am I negatively reinforcing? The stopping of the tantrum. Prior training is really important. Don't even think of punishing till you've trained the dog. It, it, it's stupid. I mean, it, I, and I, I could do tests with you, and, and you would just get punished and punished and punished. Um, actually, I would do that. Can someone set up seven chairs down the front here really quickly so, while I'm talking? Pardon? Yes, I know Harry Harlow's monkeys. Um, always remember that... There may be a hundred wrong ways for a dog to do it. There's one right way. So why don't you just teach the right way from the beginning? Okay. So train the dog first, then punish. Consistency. 
Here's the biggie. When you are using punishments in training, you have to be consistent. When you're using rewards in training, you don't. Are humans consistent? No. This is the biggest advantage to using rewards in training. What is the power of a variable reinforcement ratio? A slot machine. <laughs> Everyone is just there. Continuous reinforcements don't work. The fixed intervals don't work. The fixed ratios don't work. Yet, the entire workforce of the world is maintained on fixed interval, payday, and fixed ratio, piece rate. It's crazy. We would never train a puppy that way. We use short-term differential reinforcement, which from the dog's point of view is a variable reinforcement until he works out the plan. Okay, let's have a, um, I'll just pick a person. Who has a really good personality? You do, right? I can tell. You just spoke up. Okay, I'm going to train you in a number of ways. Feedback to dogs is binary. You get it right, you get rewarded. You get it wrong, you're punished. Most owners, if the dog gets it wrong, they ignore it. If he gets it right, they ignore it. So the binary feedback is zero. Human nature makes us ignore the good, punish the bad. So I'm going to, I want you to do something. I'm not telling you what it is. Do it. No! Do it. Come on, do it. This is a bloody demonstration. Stand up. Stand up and come over here. All right, now do it. It should be bloody obvious to you. Do it. No, 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 no. Good, sit down. Okay? It's so difficult. All right? Now I'm going to do it the nice way. You know the old, you know, the training game with Karen Pryor. So what I'm doing is the training game, but I'm giving you six different binary feedbacks, and they're all different. Now what I'm going to do is if you get it right, I'm going to say yes. But if you get it wrong, I'm going to ignore you. Do you want to have a go? Off you go. Stand up. Okay, go back to your chair. All right, you see the problem with that? It's taking forever. I can't say yes once because she hasn't done anything right yet. All right, now I'm going to do it slightly different. I'll use you again if I may. Okay, this time I'm going to tell you when you get it wrong. I'm not going to tell you what you're doing wrong, but you're going to get information that it is wrong. Okay, so I'm not going to say yes, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say yes, nope. So if you're doing it wrong, I'm saying nope. All right, off you go, do it. Nope, 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 nope. All right, sit down. You see how much easier now she's starting to get it. I'm going to do it once more with her, but this time I'm going to use an instructive reprimand. If you get it right, I'm going to say yes. And if you get it wrong, I'm going to tell you you're getting it wrong and what you should do to get it right. Do it. Go and sit in your chair. Sit in your chair. Sit in your chair. Yes. Thank you. You get it? How much quicker it is to learn when your punishment is instructive? I could have been staying here doing the, you know, the reward only thing forever. Goodness knows, she would have sat on every chair, right? This is no different from the thing doing the Martin Dealey training with all the rabbits as distractions, but I want you to retrieve a tennis ball. These are just put out as distractions. No, I want you to sit back in your own chair. It's so simple. If we use the punishment only, you're never going to get there. And you freeze. You give up. See how quickly she gave up? And then you shut down. If it's rewards only, it's kind of fun, but it takes forever, and people get frustrated. Well, I'm sure there's a number of us here would say, well, if people get frustrated, maybe dogs do too. When we now say you're getting it right and you're getting it wrong, oh, see how she keeps now going to try other things. She walked there, nope, 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 started going back to her place, and she was going to get it right very quickly. All right? So now I change it to, let's make it instructive. Bingo! Within two seconds of her getting it wrong, she's got it right. There we go. We will now, I would, we have to finish on time. I will answer questions all afternoon if you have them. I will be here if someone fills my beer up and then we can do questions individually. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, IACP. Don't go away, Ian, because you, you're too early, I think. I have a feeling you are. It might be me, but I'm what? just going to have a little look. Oh, do I end too early? Oh, gosh, yes. You've got another half an hour. Oh, cool. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ian Dunbar. <coughs> okay. Ah, 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 ah. Good. Better. Okay, stay. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, then we'll take the questions. I think you were first. You still have your question? No? Okay. You were second. Do you have yours? Yeah, up the back, up the back, up the back. Up the back with the microphone. Okay, this microphone one Microphone to the back, please. Microphone to the back. This one Microphone to the back. Your second question. First question. Thank you. Okay. okay Instructive actually, reprimand didn't work with the microphone. <laughs> second question. Yes. We were sitting here when you were talking about squabble. Define what? squabble. Is that what the word was? Oh, dog squabbling? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When two dogs go... Okay. Yeah. Okay, now, with your little demonstration there with her in the chair, she knew what go back to the chair means. So yep. how do you talk, t say you were talking to her in, in Portuguese, uh, how would you have been able to okay, do that I'll, in I'll Portuguese? Okay, I'll do an, another one, okay? Uh, I'll do it to you. Leite chai, pesi pesi. Leite chai, pesi pesi. Right, so the first rule of punishment, what, is what? Prior training is necessary. So not only does the dog need to know what you want him to do, he has to understand the word that you're using to get him to do it, sit. Let's go back to yesterday. How long does it take to teach a dog that sit means sit? Someone has it on the van out there, they should know. A lifetime. A lifetime. Jeb stole my heart yesterday. Yeah, he was so cool, so... oh. Those ears, so cool, he was so good, all I've got to do is stretch my brain a little to put the owner in a situation that's slightly different, and we say sit, and not only does the dog not do it, you were all convinced he was really trying. He wasn't blowing her off, he wanted to do it, he just never heard her say sit before when she's lying on the ground. And this is the difficult thing to understand about dogs, they are ultra discriminators. It's unbelievable. If you train a dog when you're sitting on that chair, that's what you've got. A dog trained when you're sitting on that chair. You train a dog in the kitchen when you have a food bowl, well, you've got a good kitchen dog. He won't know what sit means in the yard. He won't know what sit means when your husband uses the word. Not your husband, obviously, but for most of the audience here. Um, I mean, you don't have a husband, is what I'm saying. <laughs> and at the park, you say sit, he hasn't got a clue. So we have to train the dog in every possible scenario. And when you are convinced that you have done this, then we can do the sit test. And I will say, okay, well, let's do this. And then you will find, oh, wow, it doesn't do it. It doesn't do it if I laugh. It doesn't do it when I'm angry. All of these things, the tone of your voice, your action, whether you're looking at them, whether you're paying attention. Here's what dogs learn. I mean, to think yourself dog. Oh, the shower's running. Trash the garbage. It's like, they learn that so fast. She's in the shower, I can't be punished. Never been punished by a naked woman dripping wet before. Shower running, trash the garbage. Oh, cell phone rang. Tighten the leash and sniff at other dog's butt. Yes, it's a dog trainer, but it's a cell phone and that stops her brain functioning. Oh, hi there, yeah, yeah, yeah quit it, quit it, quit it, okay. okay. So, the dogs learn different situations when you can't be punished. Um, and they learn so specifically what you want them to do. When you train a dog in your backyard, and you've been doing it for 70 years. I have a picture of you when you were four, preparing for your arch dog. Uh, the poor thing, in, they died before you got there, but now we got it. It's all right. And you kept coming in every day, and you told mum and dad, it's perfect in the backyard. I just got a perfect 200. How many people have had perfect 200s in the backyard? I did it every night, every night, because every time the dog made a mistake, I did a mulligan. I didn't see that stay break, I'll do it again. And I put together a perfect 200 every night. In the ring, how many perfect 200s did I get? Zero, a zero. The closest we got was 197. We did, though, get second high in trial with a Malamute. I feel here, though, I should mention that although there were nine Malamutes who started in this category, only two qualified. <laughs> when we did the leave your, when the judge said leave your dogs, seven dogs left the ring. It was unbelievable. One went back to the Winnebago, one shot over to confirmation, one went into the woods, you know, one went to the shade and laid down, you know. Anyway, so 
teaching a dog that sit means sit, um, it's a lifetime process, which is why my criteria in pet dog training is I just want them to learn one command really well, sit. It's so useful. It allows the dog freedom. He can be allowed to walk off leash as long as the owner's watching that dog and every 15 minutes they go, sit, good girl, go play. And if they think the dog's going to get in trouble, the, something suddenly changes. Oh my God, there's a person on horseback. Sit. Now I'm going to walk up and put you on leash. You sit, problem over, and I'm not going to call you to me. I'm not having you in motion with a horse with a rider on it there. I'm going to walk over, put you on leash, stand there, let the horse go by, then let you off leash again. If that sit works, you've got a very valuable command. But it's so difficult to train in that it always works. I limit my goals in puppy class, obedience-wise, to I just want you to learn a sit and a stay. Is Dale Nakashima here? She, Dale? She's probably got bored. She's heard me so many times. Uh, musical chairs. There's your pet trained dog. You have a lightning off-leash sit. If you touch the dog, you're disqualified. So you walk along, and the music is, another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. The music stops. Sit! You run for the chair. There aren't enough chairs. The person or people who don't have chairs can do anything to get your dog to break. They can waggle a hot dog. They can throw food treats at it. The three things they can't do is say your dog's name, touch your dog, or frighten it. Judgment call by me, the MC. But they can say, puppy, come here, come here, come here, puppy, come on, pop, 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 pop. And you think about it, and you think, oh my God, Ian, that's not fair. Of course it is. You're in the park with your dog. Um, who has a Schutzen dog? Anyone here? Yeah, you're in the park with your Schutzen dog, and he's doing a nice sit-stay, and you're walking away from him, and there he is all on his own. And over there is a little girl with her puppy saying, Puppy, come here. Do you want your Schutzen dog to leave and go to her? No. That's why we use the dog's name, which tells the dog the next command is for you. And I would strongly advise you, I, didn't, I meant to say this yesterday, I didn't. This is really important advice. If you have a very valuably trained dog, so for that I mean is you're training the dog for TVs, uh, TV demos, um, to demo for your company, or as a competition or working dog. Once you've trained it, you don't want the training destroyed, right? Well, I told you about the, your husband having the pizza people around and breaking sit stays and down stays. Well, you do it too. Susie Bluford, bless her heart, the number one trainer in the country and the first trainer to get a thousand Och points. I went to see her in Carmel. I drove down, said, hi, Susie. Hi, Streaker. That was her dog. Okay. What was it? Uh, I can't remember how many perfect scores she got. She did have 39 high-end trials, you know, with Streaker. And then she said, do you want coffee, Ian? Streaker, get off the couch. And I said, oh, yeah, I'd love coffee. What, what do you want? Uh, you want sugar in it? Yes, but Streaker, off the couch. And then, do you want uh, milk? Yes, please. Streaker, off the couch. Then I stir my coffee and go and sit on the couch with Streaker and drink it. <laughs> this is what happens to your training. You've got to protect that. The way you do it is you have three different names for the dog. As soon as you do this, you can become much more relaxed. The dog gets to relax more, and you have a much more reliable dog. So with Omaha, bless his heart, hardly an obedience whiz, but oh my God, was he reliable. And the only footage is at the end of the Sirius DVD, and you'll see him. You know, 90 yards away, unedited video, so you can see this isn't edited together, this is what he does. 90 yards away, down, sit, Stand, come, heal, sit while I'm healing and walk off. You know, he was a reliable dog because I worked on reliability. And he could turn it on when instructed. By that I mean he could, ah, that's what I want out of a dog. You know, that he will just explode with energy on cue. The cue is his name. When he's around the house, I call him Ohm. O-H-M. Which I thought was highly appropriate because you know what it stands for, right? Resistance. Yeah, a single unit of resistance. <laughs> so I would say, Ohm, come here. Now, I presented this to NorCal Goldens 24 years ago, and I thought I was going to be stoned. I mean, not stoned. I mean, they were going to stone me for speaking heresy. And I said, when my dog is Ohm, he may disobey me. And they said, you allow your dog to disobey you? I said, yeah, and so do all of you. All I'm doing is formalizing it. 
When I say Om, come here, it means Om, good buddy. If you want to come here, I'd really like it, but if you don't, that's okay too. If I wanted you to come, I wouldn't have called you Om. You're my dog, you live with me. I don't want to live with a bloody machine. Come here, sit down, be enjoyable. <laughs> I mean, I want the dog to have feelings, and I, I had a career in preference testing, for God's sake. That's what I did as a scientist. I'm walking the dog, the Big Springs Trail, and we get down the bottom, and there's a fork in the trail. That absolutely fascinates me. Which way does he want to go today? I would never lead the dog through that fork. Because for some reason, this fork fascinated me. Does he want to take the high road? or the low road. And the high road's the rocket, and the low road's puddles and muddy. All right? And I was just interested, which road does he want to take today? And I don't give a shit which ones he chooses. But I just want to know. I love this dog. I used to drive him for frozen yogurt on Sundays <laughs> because he told me he loved it. How did I know that? Preference test. Ice cream, yogurt. You're only allowed to lick one. Okay? Ice cream, yogurt. You're only allowed to lick one. Ice cream, yogurt. 10 to 0, frozen yogurt. So I'm not going to take him for ice cream. You will damn well enjoy this ice cream. We've driven a long way. No, I want to give him what he wants, his preference. So always at the fork of the road, I stop and say, go on, Omaha. And he had to get 20 yards ahead before I would join him. And we did this for five years, every Sunday on this trail. And he would, I, I couldn't work it out. Some days he wanted to go this way, some days that way. And I could never work out rhyme or reason. Didn't have to do with the weather, but it had to do with his preference. It's like today, I think I'll take... It's like me, yesterday. You know, Bud or Coors. Ooh, Bud or Coors. Bud or Coors. Bud! I don't know why I said Bud at uh, 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 Chili's, but I said Bud, and I had a Bud. Maybe tonight it'll be Coors. Who knows? But if I say Coors, I want a Coors. I don't want someone saying, drink this beer. I say, but I don't like dark beer. Drink it, Ian. You see what I mean? So preference is really important. When I say Om, come along, it means I'm moving over here. Do you want to follow? Om, settle down. It means it'd be nice if you settle down now, but you're not on duty. You're not a Schutzen dog. I don't want you down like this. I hate that when people have trained Schutzen dogs. And, and, I mean, you see them, and then they say, plats. And as soon as they say that word, you think, oh, shit, that dog thinks he's at a trial. Oh, sorry. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, you're never going to hold your hand in front of you again. You're just thinking, I hope the dog knows the difference. Because by saying plats, she used the Schutzen command, which puts the dog down and on alert. It's madness, you know, because she's going to lose the reliability in the Schutzen, or in the obedience, or with the gun dog or with the frisbee dog, or the demo dog. If I want him to do it, I say, Omaha, sit. What does Omaha mean? It means, Om, good buddy, the rules have changed. Listen to the next word and do it, no exceptions. However, this is not an obedience trial, and cameras aren't rolling, so it looks sloppy if you want. But get your butt on the ground, and get it on the ground now, no matter what I'm doing, what you're doing, or what's going on. That single word, Omaha, says all that. Omaha, sit. What does this mean? It means I can relax. Oh my God. You know, when I had Omaha, for the first two years, I, I literally, I was panicked. He would do anything wrong. Could you imagine if I was on TV with him and he urinated? What it would do to my reputation? Could you imagine if he fought with another dog in the training community? Oh, well, that's Dr. Dunbar's dog. It would trash everything that I stood for if he bit someone. That was what it was all about for me. All of this was about teaching dogs, please don't bite people because then they kill you. Please like people. I know that difficult to live with. I have to live with them too. But even worse, people have to live with me. It is difficult, I know that, but please don't bite us. Please love us. You know, if you're upset, tell us. Walk away. Take the higher ground. Just walk out of the room. Maybe growl if you have to, but probably you'll get punished if you growl. So maybe it's not a good tact. Personally, when dogs growl, I always say thank you, considering the alternative. When a Roddy growls at me, thank you, Mr. Roddy. Because if you don't, we have to change your breed to an Akita, and then we're in trouble. Sorry, Scott, wherever you are, but we all know they're not going to give you too many warnings.
A Rottweiler, they're so faithful. They will warn you for two years. And then when the dog bites you, everyone says, oh, wait, suddenly, he's been perfectly trustworthy for two years. Wrong. And then suddenly, wrong. He bit without warning. Wrong. He warned you 200 times, you know, and without reason. Shit, this dog has five reasons to bite you. Number one is you're an arsehole. <laughs> I would bite you myself if it was socially appropriate. You know, how dare you say the dog bit without warning and without reason? I'm sorry, calm down here and take a breath. <sighs> This is Dr. Dunbar talking now, I'm back with you. So when I say Omaha, it simply means you have to do it. Which means I can relax when I live with him. I don't have to be on tender hooks, okay? It means he can relax. He doesn't have to be on tender. He can lie on his back. He can break wind. He's this dog actually was a great tent dog. When I showed him in obedience, I thought, stupidly, if I exercised him before, he'd be better in obedience. So we went for an eight hour run. Uh, I mean, eight mile run. <laughs> eight hour run. <laughs> yeah. I'm always in the ring at 8 a.m. Because I travel so much, I have to sign up so far ahead. And way back then, it was first come, first served. So I'm in the ring at 8 a.m. I had to get up at 6 to run him. We car camped. You know, we slept in a tent. I am not a morning person. I mean, this dog was beautiful. You put him in the tent, he would go up the end and lie down. He was just a beautiful pillow. He had one problem. He would break wind all night long. There are some nights I daren't light my cigar because I thought oh, whoop, we would just go up like a balloon, you know, the Hindenburg disaster or something. Anyway, we have one more step. Wahoo. After a while, and this is actually after a TV program when he wrecked the set. It was a two-hour program with a veterinarian. Uh, it was down in San Jose. It was 91 degrees outside. In the studio, it was 96. I, they wanted Omaha. I bring him down. I come in and I said, it's really hot. Can we do Omaha first so I can have someone take him to the shade? And the vet says, no, we have an hour program of questions and answers first. We need him for the second program. We bring him on. My puppy trainer, who was then, for some reason, had an elephant. Now, they don't explain to me why, but in her backyard in suburban Cupertino was an elephant. I'm, I'm not kidding. There it was in her backyard. She was an elephant trainer. As, I don't know where she got this elephant. And it was stolen and taken to Nevada. It became an FBI case, federal case. Stolen goods crossing state lines. It was amazing. The feds were all around the puppy training. So where's the elephant? I don't know where the bloody elephant is. You know. So anyway, she's holding Omaha. And now I take him to do my demo. And the first thing is teeth, showing teeth. And then I say what a wise up is. They say, what's a wise up? I say, it's in puppy class when someone's got a, a rotty puppy and they're treating him like a little bear. I tell them to look in my dog's eyes. And when they do, I do this. And the dog goes, Whoa! and they wise up in a second. But what they're dealing with is a dog. Okay? So I showed him the wise up on camera, which frightened the life out of him. And then he wants him by my side to do an obedience thing. Well, Omaha just walks off. I'm on TV. So I say, Omaha puppy, come on. <laughs> and I can see the monitor there. Come here. Good boy. Yeah, come here. My elephant trainer thinks it's a good idea to put him on leash, and she throws the leash to me. So I'm on camera, right? And it goes over to the vet, and I'm getting the leash like this, and I pull the leash, and I'm pulling this dog, and it's like a dead sea bass. <laughs> and I'm pulling him along the floor. So I get him here. You see, it's so horrible. You see his head, like, being strained up, you know, on the camera. So then I, I let him go, oh, shit. I make the mistake. I tie his leash to my chair. So now you see this. Well, the most important things about dog whoop, behavior is whoop, and he's pulling on the chair. Then he walks behind me, and here is an easel with a veterinary caduceus on it. He comes behind me, round, collapses the easel, bam, like this. It's amazing. So after that, I thought, number one, I should always be myself on camera. I reprimand him at home. I punish him at home. From now on, I'll do it on TV. It's absolutely wrong to pretend I don't do it. As ugly as it may look, you've got to be honest to people, to tell them that, no, he's this way because I'm sweet and say, good boy, Omaha. No, he's this way because I teach him how to be, I praise him for doing that, and then when he goes off track, I correct him, and we get back on track again. Okay? So I then thought, how can I correct him, but no one knows? Because now we're moving into the obedience ring. 
and it was a terrible show where we broke the AKC record for number of rings visited in off-leash healing exercise. <laughs> that in the off-leash healing exercise, he was in five rings. I'm walking along like this, you know, really nicely, turn around, about turn, I walk, and he goes, whoa, 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 bunny hop. And that, in Malamutian, means I'm just going to check this golden out now, five rings away. <laughs> and he just goes down. Jumping over the ring fences, he slots into this golden between the golden and the man who's healing the golden. And he's like, <laughs> like this. And so I'm walking the pattern. I've already gone out of the ring because the judge is just like, he's given up on me, right? And then he said, Dr. Dunbar, and I said, should I keep walking the pattern? He says, no, 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 I come back. And he says to me, I remember this guy's name. His name was Lee. He was a wonderful judge. He was so sweet. And he says, Control your dog, rising intonation. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> it's kind of like, I hope so. This was his forte. What was he not good at? Healing beautifully. We didn't do much of it, and I'm not very good teaching beautiful healing. The distance sit under distraction. And you've got to imagine I had 300 people watching my ring. The Alaskan Malamute specialty is on. It's so embarrassing. You walk along and stop and your dog sits and every single Malamute owner goes, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> like they've never seen it before, you know. So anyway, control your dog. I said, Omaha, sit. I'm not kidding. These five rings went silent. Here's a Malamute, five rings away, he sits. And then I said, well, should I call him? And, and the dog said, do you think he'll come? He said, oh yeah, he'll come now. He knows that the sit means you've got to do it. I said, Omaha, come. This was the best recall we ever did in competition. <laughs> he's herring towards me. He sits so straight and he looks up at me like this and then he does the Miss Piggy sort of, <laughs> you know, the judge. Anyway, the judge always do. He will always do that. His reliability on a single command is 95%, but within three seconds, it's 100%. If I say sit, he sits. Then we've worked on that. He said that it was amazing. He said, then why didn't you give the dog a second command? And I said, you can't do that. You can't give a second command. <laughs> and in class, my trainer had drummed this into me. You can never give a second command. And this being the AKC, I thought, I wonder what happens if you give a second command. I mean, do they, like they castrate you or something? Or they ban you from showing? And then he said, oh no, all it means is you would lose a couple of points, in your case, zero points. I wouldn't hear a second command with a Malamute owner, you know. I've given them 20 extra points when they come in the ring anyway. I want to give you your CD so you never come back, you know. Oh no, no, I'm at a Border Collie owner. When I see a black and white dog, I just think, minus two on healing. That's how I start my score sheet. They've got to do really well to get those minus two points knocked off now. They've already got 198 before they start. So I thought, how can I do that without him knowing? Okay? How can I communicate to him? Because I knew, I knew this. This is what I, I truly believed. Now, I may be wrong, because this is not what I know, but it's what I believe that he really liked me and he really wanted to help me out. But it would be a joke if I get up to heaven and Omaha was, he was so wrong. He said, my day, my 15 seconds of fame was when I left you in the healing. I thought it was hilarious. I left Dr. Dunbar healing on his own. <laughs> it may be, I don't know, he wants to dominate the world too. You know, I have no idea, okay? But I really thought he wanted to do it. And if I could just tell him, Omaha, if just for three minutes, you could look at me like you respect me and do everything that I ask you with some panache. I would raise goats for you and sacrifice one a night for you to eat. And then I'm sure, or for him it would be, I would catch salmon and give you one a night. And he would say, oh, I can do that, no problem. I knew if I could communicate that, he could do it. So that's what I tried to do. So we came up with a third name, Wahoo. And what Wahoo means is Omaha, which means you have to do it. Omaha, just for the next minute or two minutes, could you get straight, look at me, smile, get your tail out, look like you're handsome, look like you love me, and do this exercise with as much pizzazz and pizzazz as you master. The option of you not doing it simply doesn't exist. 
The question of failure is not here. This is showtime. It's a performance. So with this name, now what I started to do was really refine each aspect of his performance. So sit, Omaha sit meant what? Put your butt on the ground within three seconds. Wahoo sit means do it with panache. Look at me, okay? So we do some Wahoo training. And of course, what do the Wahoo responses get? Oh, jackpot rewards. I mean, mega rewards, okay? What most people will do now is train this up, and then they will abuse it and lose it. So if you're Wahoo training a dog, you must never tell anyone in your family what the Wahoo name is. A real good trick is train the dog in a foreign language, not German, not American, and not French. It can be gibberish, but if you'll find um, gibberish, you'll probably forget. But a foreign language, great languages for training are Spanish, sientate, uh, Italian, Japanese. They are like consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. You can come out with beautiful commands in those languages. And a new name for your dog, and when you use this, use this new name, the dog knows, ah, we're at Wahoo phase. And because it's a foreign language, it's unlikely that your family or friends will learn all the words. You can't use German, everyone knows it. Everyone is fussing and platzing. Even here, I've heard them outside. And French too, couche, a pied. You know, everyone's doing that. Uh, and American is a total no-no. Now, so we train him to really do this and get on the ball, okay? We really show it up. You mustn't abuse it. So when you turn yourself on to Wahoo, you do it for three minutes at a time and you stop. Not only do you turn the dog into Wahoo, you become Wahoo's owner. Now, you can use the transformation in yourself as extra cues to the dog a performance is coming. What I used was pretending that I was nervous. Because when you go into rings, a lot of people get nervous. I don't. But if you haven't proofed the dog to your signs of being nervous, it will work against you. It will spook the dog. Okay? So for those of you who get nervous when you show, this is a great bit of advice. For me, I just did it because I know I would get away with it and no one would question me. So I walked to the ring with Ohm. And we used to get lots of abuse. Come on, Ohm. He's on a six-foot leash, roaming, sniffing, peeing. Trying to sniff other dogs. <laughs> get your dog away. Control your dog. It was horrible. And it's actually why I stopped showing. My dog's beautiful. You know, he's not going to fight. You know, control your own dog. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> off we go with Ohm. And then I'm outside the ring, and I say, settle down, Ohm. So it's loose leash, and I'm standing here like this. And I'm watching the other person do their routine, and I'm starting to rock. Because I know I can get away with it. And then my body does this. Then I say, Omaha, heel. So Ohm, who's settled down, sits at heel. But he's looking over there. But then I start going into Wahoo transition. I do this. Take your hands, contract every muscle in your body like this, close your eyes and go and look at your dog. Your dog now sees all the signs of you being terrified. Huge pupils, you're sweating, do you want to feel my forehead? Dripping in sweat, your body temperature is blipped, okay? And when I would do that, he would slowly look up at me and, and he's thinking, he's wahooing, he's wahooing. I would do this. And the steward comes up and they say what I think is the stupidest question they could ever ask. Are you ready, Dr. Dunbar? <laughs> and every time I go, <laughs> I say, no. <laughs> what on earth makes you think I'm ready for this? <laughs> you know, I said, two seconds, I will be, two seconds, hang on. <sighs> I bend down to Omaha and I whisper in his ear, Omaha to Wahoo. And I stand up, wahoo heel. And many people ask me, what are you whispering to your dog before a show? I say, instructions. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell them my keyword. As soon as I say wahoo, he is <laughs> like this. And we walk in the ring like this, and we stop, we do the exercises, and then when it's over, if you want attention, all of you have attention commands. Very few of you have, now you can relax commands. This is so simple. We finish that exercise, judge says, exercise finished. And I just go straight from Wahoo to Omaha down. Come on home. Boom. Instantly, he knows he can relax, I can relax. And attention should go like this. Turn it on, turn it off. 
Most people say, watch me, watch me, and the attention goes, Ew. If you want attention, you've got to tell the dog, you know, watch me, Zzz, relax, boom. Okay? So, with the wahoo thing, you know, if you're nervous now, your signs of nerves are going to work for you. Um, at the end of one show, the judge came up to me, and of course I knew all the judges. I've talked at all their clubs, you know. A judge comes up to me and he says, Dr. Zambai says, you get so nervous. I said, oh, yes, you know. I don't get nervous at all. And he says, why do you do it? I said, for him. <laughs> hey, I'm out of here, right? Thank you. <laughs>